We're going to begin our service with military honors for his service to his country. We ask everyone to, re to pre please rise and place your hand over your heart. If you are a veteran or currently in the military, it is proper to salute if you wish.
Baruch Dayan Hamet, we praise the judge of truth. If you have a, a cell phone or a pager, would you please either turn it off or set it to stun? Yeah, Star Trek, you know, 1968. Some things are, are difficult to uh, recycle or stop saying, and that's one of those things. Baruch Dayan Hamet, we praise the judge of truth. Let us begin as we recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we gather to remember our dear Leonard Katz, it's a privilege to call for grandson Stephen to speak words of eulogy for his beloved grandfather. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for being here today. This is the third time I've stood up here in this situation. And um, for once, I can say that it at least feels like an appropriate time. Um, my grandfather had an amazing life, which is evidenced by everybody here to remember him. He didn't die young or tragically. I've thought for a few days about what I could really say about my grandpa that people wouldn't already know. So I figured I would just share a couple personal reminiscences and just give an idea of what kind of person he was to me. Um, I've been close with my grandpa since I was very young. I was adopted by my grandparents at 15, but I've actually been living with them basically every weekend uh, since I was about three, and probably even younger than that that I don't remember. And growing up, my grandfather was the most amazing person, the coolest person in the world. He was old, but he had all the amazing technology around. He had every computer every VHS tape, every new video game system. Um, he was so smart. He taught me how to play chess. Um, he probably also taught me that chess was not my future because I've never beaten him in my entire life. <laughs> Even when he started to lose a little bit up there, it was never quite enough for me to get it. Um, but he would tell me stories about his, um, his days of being a chess champ. Uh, he was once the only person in a 30-man simultaneous match to beat the uh, great, famous grandmaster Samuel Ryshevsky, who himself was a chess prodigy. Um, I think he was one of the first people to teach me about storytelling and the imagination. He would get me wrapped up in stories about a hidden world of dinosaurs and lost kingdoms in our crawl space and sometimes that scared me and I needed to sleep in bed with them because I was a little afraid of having all that down there um, <laughs> but he he taught me how to be a good storyteller and he taught me how to win people over 
I know that my aunts like to joke that genius skips a generation, that my grandfather was a genius, and apparently I am too. But whatever other gifts he had must have skipped two generations because I never was able to be like him in the way that he never left someone's side, it seemed like, without making their day a little better. Um, there were times when it drove me crazy. He was the biggest small talker in the world. He could not pass by an a restaurant employee or a fast food window or anything without making conversation, making jokes, making sure someone cracked up. Um, and I realized that that was just a gift he had. That he was somebody who knew the right thing to say. Um, as a kid, I must have thought that he knew every single person in the city because I don't think we ever left the house once without somebody coming over and saying, Dr. Katz, I'm your patient. And I used to think he must have the most amazing memory in the world, too, because he knew every single one of them. And later he did confide in me. They didn't always know all of them, but he was never going to admit that. He never wanted any of his patients to think that they weren't important to him or that he hadn't remembered. Um, he was somebody who didn't have a ton of hobbies, but excelled at the ones he did. He became so good at raising saltwater fish that he had a giant 400-gallon uh, tank built into our house at one point. Uh, when he finally dismantled it, the Cleveland Aquarium took quite a few of his fish with them. Um, we built a spare back room that he turned into a lush greenhouse full of orchids that he bred and grew. Beautiful ones that many people here have seen. And the one that I could never quite reconcile, given him being the nicest, smiliest, most mild-mannered person I knew, the perfect contrast to my fiery grandmother, was that he was apparently this hotshot desperado gambler who put himself through med school in secret backroom casinos and would regale me of stories of him in, in Vegas, Mike Carlo, Macau, of just, you know, counting cards, winning lots of money, getting kicked out of casinos, and um, stories about, you know, he, t he told me once when he was at the craps table and next to him was one of the owners of a luxury car company and that he was talking to the croupier and the guy was up $2 million. And by the end of the night, the croupier said, we'll have all of our money back. And sure enough, he was into them by a million by the time the night was over. Um, he had a lot of other good Vegas stories, too. Um, and I'm sure there are other people in here who know them. Um, when I found Pop and knew he was not here anymore, I after dealing with the formalities of giving a police statement and dealing with talking with my family, there was something I tried to find in the basement and couldn't, but I thought it was the perfect encapsulation of what kind of grandfather and person he was. Um, I've always loved video games. My grandparents got me all the newest ones. It's the most spoiled kid on the planet. <laughs> um, and Pop had a knack for still being able to follow technology, even though he was an older guy. You know, he was always good on the computer. He was using AOL in the 90s. Um, he was an early adopter of a lot of stuff. Um, but he didn't, I don't think he ever really got video games. But he watched me, he watched me play them. And I remember one day I came home and there was a manila folder out and it was labeled I forgot exactly, but I think it was Steve, Steve's Games, something. And he had went to the library and gotten the most recent issues of, of game magazines and stuff, and he photocopied things from the games that he knew I played, circled stuff like codes to use, and said that he, all he wanted in return was to be able to watch me play it when I did. Um, he was... Uh, a really amazing man, and I'm so glad that there are so many people here to celebrate him. Thanks.
And to those words spoken, let us say, as a prayer, let us say, Amen. Privileged call for Morgan. Oh, Stephen, that was so perfect, so perfect. I loved that. In case you aren't familiar with who I am, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Morgan Caruso, Bobby Sigmund's daughter, Lori's stepdaughter, Vicky's niece. I've been lucky enough to call Papa Len my grandfather for the past 20 years since my sister Taylor and I were just teenagers. On behalf of our family, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here today to remember such an important person, Papa Len, who was here for us every single day of his life. He was a father to my father, who lost his own at a young age, a grandfather to my sister and I when we had no one else to fill that role. And we all knew that he proudly went through a whole other generation of parenting with our cousin Stephen. Stephen, it's no coincidence that Papa was here to enjoy your intimate special wedding day when recently, just less than a month ago, you married Bridget. And I'll never forget his face as he sat directly center next to Auntie Vicky as you walked down the aisle right hand in hand with Lori directly towards him and how happy his face looked. So what a special day for our family and I know how proud he was of you, Stephen, on that day and how hopeful he was that you'd have a beautiful future together. I'll also never forget how absolutely excited and supportive he was of you in every single academic success, and he just loved to brag about you. So others today can tell you more about the incredibly brilliant man Papa was in his long career as a doctor of dermatology, how he was kicked out of casinos for counting cards, and the many fascinating stories about how he probably diagnosed some or many of you with growing an alien inside of you before he joked that it was just a simple skin irritation. What I'd like to focus on most in the time I'm speaking this morning is just Papa Len as grandpa and great grandpa. In talking to Lori, it's what she's truly most grateful for because we got to be one great amazing family. And half of this room is here because of it and half our originals. Lori loves that Papa Len welcomed our family as his family, and so do I. Because of this, he was able to enjoy five great-grandchildren. He absolutely cherished the kids and had a relationship with each of them, knowing what they liked and excitingly putting out that stuff when they came over. First came Carson, and for example, with his love of remotes at one point, he got to have like 10 of them there. <laughs> then Mason, and then just in the last year and a half came Addison, Carolyn, and the newest little guy, Cameron. Every one of those babies was plopped right on top of Papa and Great Grammy's laps. They were great grandparents who were really involved in the kids' lives, knowing what they were up to and always playing with them when they came over. And the kids loved to spend a ton of time there because of that, didn't you guys? So. One of my favorite memories easily was when Carson was about two. Papa and Great Grammy got him going on the computer. Carson would sit right on Papa's lap and they literally spent hours not only playing but learning as they believed the computer could be the basis to expanding on the sheer brilliance they were sure the kids had and we joked it had to be inherited from them, wink, wink. <laughs> But really, you see how smart our Jeopardy champion of a cousin Stephen is, so they had to be doing something right. And Carson learned his letters and sounds pretty much all from sitting on Papa's lap, the computer, watching videos and games, and I love picturing them right there at the bedroom desk laughing and learning to this day. The kids loved Papa's fish, feeding them and learning about them, even when he insisted on telling us weird things like which, which, which he believed would be the next to reproduce and how many males should be with the females or something like that. Um, yeah, that beautiful orchid room um, turned into a playroom eventually. Anyone who knew Papa was aware of his great love of anything scientific or beautiful, and he carefully curated this most gorgeous room of living orchids that anyone could ever have in a home, complete with lights and clips to be sure each could be displayed at its finest. My husband, Anthony, loved to walk through there with him as he loudly explained everything he was doing. 
when our boys got older, he actually converted the orchid room into a playroom where to this day all the toys in the house are stored, complete with a roller coaster, a play kitchen, and even video games now. The kids dash into the house and go straight for the back room where they know all their stuff will be waiting for them. But that's not the only place the kids hung out. They were always in the bedroom, jumping on top of the famously huge double queen-size bed, peeking under it for hidden treasures that were planted, watching TV in a pack-and-play when they were babies. At all ages and stages, the kids hung out in that bedroom with the best great-grandparents ever. And I love how those memories can live on and we can keep talking about fun times with Papa and Great Grammy. This morning when we were talking to the boys, I asked Carson his favorite memory about Papa. He so sweetly said with this big smile that he loved when he and Mason would creep into their bedroom and how Papa would jump out and yell, Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. And he showed me exactly how great Papa did it, how he walked with his hands. Carson's like, no, you got to do the hands, how he, how he walked when he did it. I love how that's a lasting, funny memory for them. And Mason would just laugh hysterically and say something along the lines of, I don't know what he's saying, but it's really funny. <laughs> Papa Len was so funny. He showed a sense of humor in almost everything he did, including, of course, the way he dressed. We loved all his wacky shirts. I've loved over the years how people would tell me they knew him, both because he was such an amazing dermatologist, but also because no one could forget the dermatologist with the crazy shirts and long ponytail. <laughs> that brilliant, hilarious guy. Taylor reminded me about when he started wearing a fake tattoo sleeve on his arm that really looked like he had tattoos all over his arm. And he loved pretending it was real, and especially the reactions. So funny and so him. Papa and his sense of humor were involved in everything until the end. Holidays, birthdays, and of course our countless Chinese food dinners around the kitchen table. Speaking of birthdays, we celebrated his 91st with a birthday party in the bedroom, and Carson and Mason made a huge banner they decorated, full of spiders, of course, and he hung out laughing with them on his couch. That is now one of my favorite memories. Another one of my absolute favorite memories I'll share quickly, uh, and I know others feel the same, is when we had Thanksgiving at Grammy and Papa's house, and there were like 30, 30 or so of us all down one shared super long stretching um, table through their giant living room, and it was just the most perfect melting pot of family who chose to be family together. All our in-laws were there, and cousins, my dad's side, and aunts and uncles from my sister and my husband's families. Friends shared the table with us, and even neighbors and their kids loved to stop by. Everyone at that table was a true part of our family. That's how I'll always remember Papa and Grammy as literally welcoming everyone to their table who wanted to be family. That's what glued us all as family. That's what brings all of you here today. Papa wanted the big family, the kids everywhere, the chaos, the fun, and he got it. And we got it all right back from him every day, and we were lucky enough to have him here with us. As my husband and I explained to our sons, ages six and four, um, God Hashem really wanted for Papa Len to meet Great Grammy in heaven, and now they're there together and they get to watch over us forever. So I know we'll always miss them, but today I'm vowing to always really remember them. So with the funny stories and the great amount of love that we truly felt from them, we're gonna talk about them a lot. As someone who's so close to my own dad, I know how deep the father-daughter bond was between Papa and Vicki and Lori. I per personally witnessed how wonderful they were as daughters and you should be so proud of how well you took care of him each and every day, keeping him loved and safe and so happy and still laughing until his very last day on earth. You too, Stephen. You were an amazing grandson, and I'm so happy Papa left us with you as our cousin. In closing, I want to remember the long marriage Papa had that we can all just dream of with the love of his life and partner in crime, Grammy Eileen how cherished he was as a grandfather, how he could help with literally any medical need you'd just consult with him first, how he was hilariously embarrassing yet so kind and generous, just the best grandfather anyone could ask for, and I'm so grateful he got to be in all of our lives and we got to be family because Lori married my dad. I'm going to remember for the rest of my life that when my husband asked for my hand in marriage, he separately went and asked just two guys, my grandfather and my father. 
So my father and my grandfather, Papa Len, just the two. I feel so blessed that I got to have him as the true definition of a grandfather in every way. And that my kids got to experience the best great grandfather and vice versa, that he got to be a great grandpa to our kids. He lived a really long and fulfilled life and we're all so lucky to have such great memories of him to carry with us forever. We love you, Papa Len. Thank you. And to those words also spoken as a prayer, let us say amen. So we gather on this most solemn occasion. It's for a reverent purpose. We pay our respects and a deserved tribute to your dear Dr. Leonard Katz. His Yiddish name is Leiby Ben Avraham Vabatya. Leiby is like lion. And, you know, he was, uh, he was a strong man, and he would, would stand up and protect you and others. Uh, laying to rest the body of Leonard is a physical act, and it's also a deeply spiritual and emotional process as well. Yesterday, as Vicki and Lori and Stephen talked about Leonard and his love of practicing medicine, which means his love of caring for and nurturing people, they spoke of his caring heart and soul and his humor and his ability to develop and grow relationships with all sorts of people from a variety of backgrounds and languages. They also said he liked to raise saltwater fish and grow orchids. So growing and nurturing living things was a reminder of the many trips to Israel that, well, many of us have gone to Israel many times. Some of us have been once, or if you've been to the Holy Land, it's a reminder of that and a verse from the second book of Samuel. In the second book of Samuel, chapter 14, verse 14, for we shall surely die and shall be as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. So how so? Well, as one drives down from Jerusalem into the Negev desert, the eye is caught in a most dramatic way by the highway scenery there's little else but desert wilderness on all sides. The dry sandstone colored earth, rocks, and a few trees. But immediately upon entering an Israeli village, one sees green everywhere. Fields of green and, and orchards. And what's the difference? The difference is irrigation. The difference is water that has been spilled on the ground and has made the earth fertile. And this may also be said of your beloved Leonard. His life is now like water spilled on the ground, water spilled on the earth. The earth, the world is greener. The world is more beautiful. The world is better for him having lived. He poured out the affection of his heart upon his beloved family. The well-watered garden of his planting was, of course, his dear Eileen of blessed memory, his helpmate and wife of more than 67 years, and also his beloved family. Your names will be shared in a moment. He lavished love upon you, and you responded like young plants to water. He loved you very, very much. He was born September 1st, 1931, to Abraham and Bessie, both of blessed memory. He was the youngest of three boys, Samuel, David, and Leonard. Now they are all of blessed memory. The family came to Cleveland from Russia sometime in the decade before Leonard was born. And the family was religious. They didn't speak a single word of English, only Hebrew and Yiddish and Russian. Leonard learned English the first day he went to school. That was the beginning of him learning English. In life, you really can't predict the future. And although he liked to gamble, he probably couldn't predict the future 100% either. But in life, you just really can't predict the future as much as we make attempts to do so. We plan and we try to shape things 
Who knew that growing up with Hebrew and Yiddish and Russian would serve him and his future dermatological patients so well? Leonard was very helpful to Russian Jews and patients in the severance office because he could communicate with our Jewish brothers and sisters who came from you know, the, the old country, where we all came from eventually, before. He attended Cleveland Heights High School, graduated in 1949. He graduated early because, as his daughter said, he was a brainiac. He, he graduated a year early. He was a junior chess champion. And he met Eileen Katz. Yes, she had the same name. Eileen Katz. He was in a fraternity at Cleveland Heights High School. She was in a sorority at Shaker, and she liked the way he looked, and that he also had the same last name. <laughs> and that was the day that she knew she would marry him, and it was the day. They were married June 21st, 1953, and it was a loving and devoted marriage and a Meshuggah marriage of 67 years. Meshuggah in Yiddish means crazy, but, you know, all of our families are just a little crazy. And that's not an insult. That's just life. They had a, a great marriage. Many blessings and many difficulties, as each family has blessings and difficulties. Three children and three grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. Going to try to list everybody. If I miss anybody, call it out, okay? All right, Vicki, her husband, Scott. And then there's Terry of blessed memory. She passed away in 2000, and her husband, Bruce, he passed away in 2002. Lori, her husband, Bobby, and then grandchildren, Stephen, and now his uh, new wife, Bridget, and Morgan and her husband, Anthony, Taylor and her husband, Michael, and then the great-grandchildren, Carson and Mason, Carolyn, Addison, and Cameron. When you think about your wedding night, you probably don't think of this. Your wife turns to you and says to you, as Eileen said to Leonard, I need $1,000. <laughs> and he said, well, I don't think we have $1,000. She said, oh, yeah, all the gifts that we've been given, it'll, it'll be $1,000. And he reluctantly says, okay. And then on the following Monday, she goes down to Merrill Lynch and she takes the $1,000 and she invests it in his name because way back then in uh, 1953, she couldn't put it in her name. And her parents would never let her go to Merrill Lynch herself anyway. So she did that and they had a marriage when his job was to bring home the bacon, the money, so to speak, and she would invest it. His job as a father was to embarrass his children with his humor and he did that frequently. So he went to Western Reserve for college. Then he went to The Ohio State University for medical school. He was in the Army from 1958 to 1960, symbolized by the flag of our beloved country. He was stationed stateside. He was in Minnesota for uh, almost a year. And he did medical exams for guys coming in. <clears throat> excuse me. For guys coming in to the Army, and he did medical exams, but he would look for emotional um, as well as physical infirmities because you know, going into the Army, even if you're drafted and you want to go, it's, uh, it's a serious business. And so he would um, check, and he would sincerely try to get four F designations to excuse guys that he thought really, really, really needed that. And at times this put him in conflict with his superiors, but Laby, which means lion, right, he, was, he would stand up to his superiors when he felt there was a, a real advocacy for a 4F designation. Leonard and Eileen moved back to Cleveland in 1960. He had a private dermatological practice uh, in Severance. He never wanted to leave the old neighborhood after 53 years. He loved practicing medicine, and he even came up and he made tools. He, he didn't really wasn't a guy who needed to take credit for everything. He liked to share with others. He had endless devotion and energy, sense of humor. He had a good bedside manner. He wasn't a guy that liked to say no to patients very often. And even if you don't remember 
the exact name of the person. He probably did recognize their, their face a little bit. And that's really, most of the time, that's, that's all anyone needs, is just to know, eh, I was recognized. He was great with children, and he had props to help them feel comfortable or engaged or maybe just distracted while he was doing the thing, so you, you've got the props to distract them. One of his favorite lines was, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. <laughs> and uh, Vicki and Lori remembered there was a girl who had some spots on her face. I guess they're called vampire spots. I'm, I learned these things. And, uh, you know, kids can be cruel, and they were making fun of her at school, and he told her, you know, after a couple of treatments, I'll, I'll get rid of those, and he did. He probably said to her, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. But he did, and she went on her happy and merry way. He appreciated those who worked for him. Kyle apparently was his right-hand woman, and uh, though both she and Leonard were left-handed. Um, and Dr. Eric Bogg apparently was his right-hand man. He was also left-handed, but the family didn't find this to be a problem. And over the decades, there were many, many more and many others who worked with Leonard. You probably worked with Leonard, and he gave you nicknames. There are too many people to, to mention by name, but please know that he appreciated you and the family appreciated you as well. Apparently, he brought in Eric to take over one day, and Lori and Vicky joked he was the perfect replacement, well, you know, minus the ponytail and the sarcasm. So he was a good replacement. Over the years, he ran a charity clinic for the VA. He did many, many other things. You heard about their uh, bedroom with the huge beds and the TV and all of that. They uh, would wear matching pajamas and watch TV and movies holding hands. Uh, there's a recent birthday picture where Leonard was sporting a nice pair of pajamas with his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And on January 20th, as you heard, Stephen and Bridget were married at the house. And so they, they did that so that the papa could be there. And he was able to attend. And it was on a very deep and spiritual, emotional level. It was uh, beautiful for everyone to be there. And Eileen was there in a, in a, in a sense as well. Spiritually, you know, they could feel her there to be there for the, the wedding. And uh, Leonard passed away. It's just been a couple of weeks. And on some level, you know, he, he had done his job finally. And, you know, was there to, to witness his, uh, his grandson married to a beautiful woman. And so last Friday, he breathed his last. And now there's just rest and wholeness and peace just as Shabbat is a time of peace, a time of rest, so too for Leonard, it's a time of rest and peace. And his soul is returning to God to be with the souls of his beloved wife and all the rest of the relatives and ancestors of our people. His soul is returning to God. We learn this from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7. The dust returns to the earth as it was. The spirit returns to God who gave it. One day all of us will join our loved ones in Olam Haba, the world to come. It's a spiritual place, not a physical place. This is a physical place. Cemetery we will go to is a physical place. The soul returns to Olam Haba, a spiritual time. We're sending along a couple of old Haggadahs with him in the casket because it's a, it's a mitzvah, it's a religious obligation to bury the body of our loved one, but also to provide respectful burial for holy books of our tradition. We're sending the Passover Haggadah in particular because Passover is a time when we recall and we give thanks for our ancient liberation from Egyptian slavery. And we're free today because many, many, many years ago of God's deliverance. And now Leonard has been liberated and he's been delivered from a deterioration of his mind and his body and and illness and pain. You have many, many memories and thoughts of Dr. Leonard Katz, and we give thanks to God for this gift of long life. 
May we be kinder and more thoughtful of others, more eager to help and serve others, do things which will make him proud, but do things that will remind you of him with his humor and his small talk in a big way, as you said. That's great. Small talk is important. Hey, at the beginning, I asked you to turn it off or set it to stun. You're like, hey, Rabbi, can't have possibly meant that, really. Yeah, you're here, you know you're here, but the, obviously the people that would be calling me, they, they don't know I'm here either. But as we think of Leonard, let us uh, be kinder or more helpful of others, to others. And so we say words from the first chapter of the book of Job. We conclude with, Adonai Natan, Adonai Nakach, Yehishem Adonai Mavarach. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and let us say, Amen. Please rise for the El Malay Rachamim prayer. Into your care, O God, we entrust the spirit of our dear Leonard Katz, Nebi ben Avraham Vabatya. For you keep faith with your children in death as in life. Sustain us that we may meet with serenity the mysteries that lie ahead, knowing that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, O God, are with us, a loving friend in whom we put our trust. You are the light of our life, our hope in eternity. El male rachamim, shochen bamromim, hametzem nuchanechona, tachak anfe hashchina, im kiroshim utohorim, kezohahara ki amazirim, et nishmat, Lebi ben Avraham v'batya, shahalach l'olamo, ba'al harachamim, yasti rehu b'seitzer k'nafav l'olamim. Va'yitzror b'yitzror ha'chaim, et nishmato, Adonai hunachanato, V'yanuach b'shalom al mishkavo V'nomar Amen Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, we are perfect rest in your sheltering presence to our dear Lady Ben Avraham Vabatia, our dear Leonard Katz. He has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. And now the funeral directors will come, and we will go in procession. To Mount Olive Cemetery, if you're not going to Mount Olive with us and you are just going to meet us back at the house, we'll be there in about an hour and 15 minutes from now. And we'll recite Kaddish for him for the next month at synagogue, Temple Israel near Tamid. The religious school kids will say Kaddish for him. Hebrew school kids are saying Kaddish for Leonard. They all need reps on the prayers, and we'll say it for Leonard. Family is asked if you wish to make donations, make them to a charity of your choice. And now we pause and we will go in procession to the cemetery.
A gentleman, as we come on out, we are going to turn to the left. You'll see the first door open. Thank you. 